All right, we're moving on to what makes sense, the thoracic aortic aneurysm, because we know these dissections are rare. They're kind of almost considered sometimes a complication. Um, if people had an aneurysm, and a lot of people, as we know, wouldn't know that. So if we work backwards to figure out through diagnosis and through knowing your family medical history, what you might be susceptible to having occur on your aorta, let's talk about the thoracic aortic aneurysm, okay? Because I think a lot of us have heard of abdominal, and we will get to that, trust me. Let's talk about thoracic aortic aneurysm, or TAA. When you hear people say ascending aortic aneurysm, please do not use the acronym AAA because in the medical world, AAA refers to an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So just say ascending or just say TAA. All right, just makes it a little bit easier. All right, comes another day of aortic disease awareness. And yesterday, or just a minute ago when I read it to you, we were given an overview of the structure and function of the aorta. So here's a trivia challenge. Which layer of the aorta, the intima, the media, or the adventitia provides the greatest strength? I'm what do you gonna think? blame I'm gonna blame Velda for distracting me with fun chatting. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well then you lose. I will tell you. It is the outer layer, the adventitia, is the strongest layer. And watch, I'll be wrong. But the answer is not here, thanks to Adam. We'll find that out, I guess, in a few minutes. All right, thoracic aortic aneurysms. So let's talk about this a little bit. Here is your aorta in this picture here. And this is your diaphragm. So this comes up underneath your lungs and under your heart. This actually separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. This is where the delineation is, all right? Okay, so you can have an aneurysm of the thoracic aorta, which would be after the arch, but it's still above the diaphragm. That is your aneurysm. Look how big that balloon structure is. That's in the thoracic upper chest. That's in your chest area. That is an aneurysm. You can also, um, but that is in your, that's your thoracic. And this above that, right above that is your descending thoracic. These doctors make it very difficult by having to like separate everything, but now things are separated into zones. And the reason why they separate them into these zones specifically for each area, like a zone of the root and a zone for a ascending and a zone in the arch and a zone in the descending thoracic and a zone in the thoracic, see where I'm going with this, is because these disease elements have a couple different nuances, a little difference in how they're going to be repaired or how treatment happens. Um, they're typically diagnosed the same way incidentally with an echo because you can still get some of that in an echo uh, above the diaphragm you're going to mainly get the arch and the ascending but you're definitely going to see this in an mri or a ct scan so if you're having that because you think you might have pneumonia it will pick up if you have an aneurysm in the uh, thoracic area whether it's descending or in the thoracic and then this, of course, is an aneurysm in the ascending, because we talked about it coming out of the heart and it's ascending upwards. And that's where a lot of individuals who have had dissections end up having the aneurysms that they have them. This is a really key critical area. This is, um, this is a little precarious. This is emergency surgery right here. Okay, it's typically always gonna be a surgical treatment. And the rest of this, there's a toss up. There's a toss up. There's now a new device. We saw Dr. Caterino from Cedar sinai discuss it. What they're realizing now is for people who dissected in the ascending and then it went all the way down. Okay, that's a type A. Just, just we used to say type A residual B, but it's just, it's A and it's, it's just an all the way dissection. They would just repair the ascending and just kind of leave the rest of it medically managed because you're, it's already time consuming surgery and you they've learned statistically just leave well enough alone. Let's get the highest volume of blood that's coming out of the heart, which is at the ascending, let's take care of it. And now what they're seeing is if they're gonna have any issue with the uh, branches of the arch, they can give you a, a graft in the ascending that goes through to the arch, includes branches if necessary, but then, 
has a product that is a graft that goes into the descending thoracic. So it's one piece, it's one piece of equipment and they're doing this right off the bat versus having that whole section be medically managed in here. So it's very interesting stuff. I think we'll be hearing some more about that, but this gives you an idea on the like types of areas where you can have a thoracic aortic aneurysm. So in an aneurysm is a bulge or a ballooning uh, area within the wall of this blood vessel, and it can cause it to dilate or get larger and stretches to a larger size than its normal width. And the major concern when an aneurysm happens is that the vessel can lose a lot of its natural strength and ability to accommodate different blood volumes, and it can rupture due to the instability. So again, we often talk about, think about a garden hose and just the wear and tear of like hitting that hose with a lot of pressure, typically by the end of the hose is where you might find it getting a little bit larger over time until it could possibly just rupture. So if you didn't want it to rupture, you'd probably wrap it in like duct tape because everybody uses duct tape for things. It's kind of like thinking about using a graft, right? It's kind of almost the same, but not really, but kind of. So aneurysms of the brain and the heart actually carry a major risk and would require careful screening, long-term monitoring and care by your doctors. Again, let's talk about a TAA, thoracic aortic aneurysm. That's any aneurysm that's in the thoracic component of the aorta, including the ascending aorta, arch or upper part of the descending up until the diaphragm. That's all thoracic. Be sure to refer to the first post, which happened earlier in that week, the day before, when we discussed the different regions of the aorta. And here we go again. We've got the valve that goes to the left ventricle of the heart. We have the ascending, three different branches in the aortic arch, and this is all descending. Descending thoracic up to the diaphragm, abdominal, all the way down. Okay, it goes down to the abdominal. All right. The easiest way to understand why a TAA might occur um, is because you have a weakened area in the wall of the artery. That's why it's going to occur. I suppose it could occur also due to trauma that ends up weakening the area, but it's when the the aorta is subjected to an increased strain or pressure for extended periods of time. Now, remember, this doesn't like necessarily mean exercise. Exercise is good. It means when you add in genetics, uh, being overweight, high blood pressure, things of that nature. Now this is extra. We don't want our aortas to be extra. This is not a time when we want them to be extra, okay? The most common cause of a TAA is atherosclerosis. Say that with chewing gum in your mouth, bet you can't do it. And that actually refers to the accumulation of fat or calcium deposits within the innermost uh, lining or the intima layer. And this can cause damage to those beautiful endothelial cells that we talked about, which creates the smooth muscle and allows the nutrients and the oxygen to flow easily. It's also strongly associated with connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, and Lois Dietz syndrome. Patients with Turner syndrome, which are women or girls, are strongly associated with a TAA, especially at the aortic root. Other risk factors, as we just mentioned, would include high blood pressure, which would cause an increased strain of blood flow and blood volume as it travels through the walls. Smoking. Smoking directly damages the endothelial cells. So don't smoke. Tobacco cessation. It's going to get mentioned at some point. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Symptoms. Here's where it gets nice and tricky because they don't usually give you any symptoms, you would not necessarily know that you have this until they become large enough, which might compress a nearby structure, such as your, I think it would compress maybe your esophagus, not your trachea. I don't know for sure, because I don't really know the entire anatomy. I don't really have that uh, memorized because I'm not a medical professional. Again, just relaying information to you. Uh, but when symptoms do end up occurring, they could cause a little bit of pain in the chest or in the back, difficulty swallowing. Okay, the esophagus, I was kind of right. Or some shortness of breath. Okay, that would be trachea. Okay, so then I was halfway right. Some people might describe like a beating mass in their chest, uh, kind of pulsates, they think. That's what they feel. It's not going to be with something that is smaller. So when you're told 
you have a mild dilation of the aorta at 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, .4, you should not be feeling this. You really shouldn't. And I would wonder if you were feeling something after, but you weren't feeling anything before you were diagnosed. Because that can sometimes happen. You, it could be really real that you feel it, but maybe you're feeling it because it's um, more in your mind and it's something that might be more psychological than anything else um, when they're smaller. Again, that all matters, somebody's body frame and, and all of that's a lot of considerations, okay? There is no one size that fits all in this scenario. Now, a rupture of a TAA is a medical emergency, okay? It will present with sudden onset of pain, sharp pain, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be horrible pain. And it's gonna be in the upper, typically in the upper back and travels to the back and downwards. There might be a sudden drop in blood pressure, which might cause you to be dizzy or maybe pass out. Again, this is common, but not necessary for everyone. I didn't feel any pain in my back. I thought I had a little bit of reflux, I had a snap in my neck on the right side. So if if I had known about this ahead of time, I wouldn't have gone to the hospital. I would never have thought it was this because they specifically continuously talk about a certain set of symptoms. Dizziness, sure. Felt like you're going to pass out? Yeah, maybe, because I wasn't really sure what I was feeling. It was new. I think a lot of people end up having a, an instinct about this and they just know uh, something's not right, and a lot of patients have said that they feel this overwhelming sense of doom and gloom. All right, diagnosis, management, and treatment. So to diagnose a TAA, a doctor's going to actually have to order a series of imaging, and they need an opportunity to try to visualize it from being outside of your body to kind of look at your entire aorta and determine if you actually have aneurysms. And this would include an ultrasound, could include a CT scan, MRI, and or angiography, um, and angi angiography, right, to determine the size and the location of the aneurysm. We're gonna have our resident Duke, will discuss all of this when it comes to these tests at a later date and time. So we will get to it, I promise you. Actually, here we go. So this is showing you your layer of your aorta and this is, I believe that this is part of the aneurysm. Um, pretty, pretty sure. This looks like it is a CT scan that you're seeing. Yep, CT scan. All right. Treatment of your TAAs will differ depending upon how big they are, obviously, and where they're located. So, um, they also really need to evaluate your, your overall care and your family history. Because if you have a strong family history of dissections or aneurysms, if they determine that you do have a connective tissue disorder, then the treatment plan is going to probably change. This magic number of intervening at 5.5 will drop. It will probably be an intervention sooner. Again, there's a million different considerations. I'm not a medical professional. I'm only telling you the things that I've heard but the numbers do not play the same for both categories of patients. So small aneurysms can just be monitored. You can get routine imagery imagery, and you can, might have to take blood pressure medications. And um, But depending upon your blood pressure, larger aneurysms can be repaired. And they're going to be repaired with either an open surgery or an endovascular procedure to ultimately prevent rupture because that would be very problematic. And some lifestyle adjustments might need to be made to reduce your risk of a TAA. Um, uh, and that might be just management of your blood pressure, your lipids levels, which that has to do with cholesterol, uh, maintaining a healthy, active lifestyle, and quit smoking. If you're at high risk for developing a thoracic aortic aneurysm or you have a family history of one, be sure to always discuss your concerns and your questions um, and potential screening options with your physician. So that was the second day of Aortic Disease Awareness Month.